1887, the time of Victoria, Queen of England and Empress of India. London is the world capital of commerce. Across the channel in Germany, a child named Albert Einstein celebrates his eighth birthday. It's been 23 years since James Clark Maxwell stated his equations for electromagnetic radiation. Beyond the Atlantic, the Americans have enjoyed more than two decades of peace and prosperity since their terrible civil war drew to a close. Waves of migrants from Europe are swelling the population of the United States. The western frontier is being settled and settling down. Looking back, 1887 seems like a time of tranquility, not only in commerce and politics, but also in science. Many physicists believed that all the great discoveries had been made. Physics had reached a state of perfection that was positively ethereal. In fact, the concept of the ether was one of its central tenets. It took a fresh point of view to see the speed of light in an entirely new light. His name was Albert Einstein, and in physics, his was the way of the future. But no one had done more to illuminate that future than Albert Michelson himself. For nearly 50 years after his first interferometer, he lived on, measuring the speed of light with ever-increasing precision. Measuring the diameter of a star for the first time ever, and even admitting, finally, that his interferometer experiment had provided the verification of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. After these was the measurement of the velocity of light. The second, the measurement of the diameter of a star. And the third was a test of the Einstein theory of relativity. Whether by an electrical device or the sun itself, light is absorbed or radiated in discrete bundles of energy. The idea was radical and disturbing, but confirming evidence was on the way. And the evidence can still be seen today in the behavior of a gold leaf electroscope. When the electroscope is charged, the leaf rises and stays aloft until it's hit by a beam of ultraviolet light. An ordinary piece of glass transmits visible light, but it blocks the high-frequency ultraviolet light. When it's interposed, the electroscope doesn't discharge. But when the glass is removed, the leaf falls again. This proves that the ultraviolet light does the job, and it's called the photoelectric effect. It was Albert Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect and not his theory of relativity that would eventually win him the Nobel Prize in physics. And in modern terms, here's what he said. An electron in a metal lacks enough energy to escape by an amount called the work function. But if an electron absorbs ultraviolet light that arrives in a bundle having the energy given by Planck's formula, then the electron can gain more than enough energy to escape from the metal. If that's the case, it can come out with kinetic energy equal to H times F minus the work function. This is called Einstein's photoelectric effect equation. It was the perfect solution, and proved as such by Robert A. Millikan in his Chicago laboratory. When he measured the energies of electrons ejected from various metals by different frequencies of light, Millikan verified that while each metal has a different work function, Planck's constant has the same universal value for all of them. 
But this explanation of the photoelectric effect not only confirmed Planck's theory, it showed directly that bundles of energy already exist in the electromagnetic field. In other words, light comes in particles, particles which are now called photons. Planck's quest for truth became a journey that led to the heart of quantum physics. Yet to the end, he himself never accepted the profound implications of his own work. And for that matter, neither did Albert Einstein, who said, it seems hard to look in God's cards, but I cannot for a moment believe that he plays dice as the current quantum theory alleges he does. To Albert Einstein, the enigma of gravity, time, and space was of no small consequence. It was a puzzle that promised enormous challenge, and if solved, the answer to perhaps some of the deepest mysteries in the cosmos. Like Newton before him, Einstein began with the law of falling bodies. Galileo didn't quite understand gravity. No one really would until Newton. But he discovered the fact that all bodies fall with the same constant acceleration. Why should the force of gravity lead to such a strange result? When calculating the acceleration of a falling apple, the mass cancels out, leaving the same acceleration for any falling body. Isaac Newton understood that the law of falling bodies meant these two completely different masses had to be exactly the same for every body in the universe. But why? Why is gravitational mass always equal to inertial mass? Could that be some cosmic coincidence? Scientists, as a rule, don't place much stock in phenomena that can be explained by mere coincidence. Albert Einstein placed none. He believed there must be some more profound law of nature that would make the law of falling bodies not a mystery, but instead something so simple it would be perfectly obvious. And the principle he chose became the basis for his general theory of relativity. It's called the principle of equivalence. Equivalence, that is, between constant gravity and constant acceleration. Imagine an experiment in which different objects with different masses all fall with exactly the same acceleration, called g. That might happen because the laboratory is on the surface of the Earth. But the same thing would also happen if the laboratory were far from Earth and everything else, say in intergalactic space. It would happen if the laboratory were accelerating upward with acceleration g. All the objects inside, obeying the law of inertia, would not accelerate. But they would all seem to fall with the same constant acceleration. Albert Einstein understood that the law of falling bodies and the mysterious equality of gravitational mass and inertial mass would be perfectly explained if the following fundamental principle were true. No experiment of any kind done entirely inside that laboratory could determine whether the objects fall because of the pool of gravity or because the laboratory is accelerating upwards in outer space. The idea seems almost too simple to be true, but Albert Einstein didn't take it lightly. Instead, he asked how the experiment would come out if it were performed with a beam of light. With the laboratory out in space, the answer was easy to see. If the rocket accelerates upward while the beam goes straight across, it must seem to bend downwards just a tiny bit. But then what would happen on Earth? The answer comes from the principle itself. Since no experiment, not even this one, can tell whether the laboratory is on Earth or in space, the result must be exactly the same. In other words, Einstein concluded that light doesn't travel in straight lines. Instead, it bends ever so slightly 
because of the gravitational force of the Earth. Einstein predicted light would likewise bend as it passed the sun. And when he said so in this letter to George Ellery Hale, it looked extremely good on paper. But not quite good enough for astronomers to risk their precious telescopes, much less their precious eyesight looking directly at the sun. And so, George Ellery Hale, Einstein's correspondent, and himself one of the great astronomers of the early 20th century, made a gentle suggestion. Why not observe the sun during an eclipse? And in 1919, that's precisely what Sir Arthur Eddington and his party of solar explorers went out and did. The triumphant success of that expedition was the first great proof of relativity and turned the quiet, shy Albert Einstein into an instant, world-famous folk hero. Everyone knew about him, even though few could understand relativity. And no one really knows why the world took Einstein to its heart. Probably, exhausted by World War I, people needed a hero. His discovery was benign, and Albert Einstein looked like everyone's favorite uncle. He also became the symbol for all scientists, and it didn't make any difference that few could understand Einstein's great work. The principle of equivalence raises an interesting question. If light travels curved paths, what is a straight line? Einstein said that it makes no sense to talk of straight lines. Space itself is curved. Not only space, but space-time. That means that space and time change as they move through gravitational fields. But how does that relate to Newtonian physics? In his laws of motion, Newton said a body moving in a straight line will keep moving in that straight line until it's acted upon by an outside force. If there are no straight lines, what is the meaning of the law of inertia? On a flat map or chart, the shortest path between two points is the familiar straight line that joins them. But not on the surface of a globe. Here, the shortest path between two points is not a straight line, but is a great circle. To generalize, the shortest path between any two points on any surface is called a geodesic. Einstein said that starlight may not really be bent by the gravitational force from the sun. Instead, it can be said to travel inertially along the shortest path between any two points in the local curved space-time. That makes it seem to bend to any observer. And for the same reason, the Earth's orbit doesn't have to be, as Newton said, a compromise between inertia, which makes the Earth want to fly off in a straight line, and the sun's gravity, which keeps the Earth circling the sun. Just like the light, the Earth can be said to move inertially, without any forces, along a geodesic and the local space-time created by the sun's presence. In other words, curved space-time or even just curved space, can create the appearance of a force even if there is none. Imagine two beings starting out on a journey, obeying the law of inertia, on what they think are two straight lines. But since they're on the surface of a sphere, they're really great circles. After a while, they start getting closer together, as if drawn by some mysterious force. They might even call that force gravity. Einstein did exactly the opposite. He eliminated the force of gravity. It can be replaced by the curvature of space-time. But Einstein now had created a mammoth dilemma. How does mass cause space-time to curve? He spent the most difficult seven years of his life, from 1909 to 1916, working on the riddle. And when he finished, he had produced nothing less than a new theory of the cosmos. It was a theory that was not designed to extend or expand Isaac Newton's mechanical universe. Instead, it was designed to replace it completely. But how could that be possible? Could it be that Newton's theory was wrong after all? Does the moon not fall 1 20th of an inch every second? 
Do planets not still sweep out equal areas in equal times? And when a spacecraft leaves the Earth, who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Newton's doing most of the driving right now. Of course, Newton's laws work just as well as they always have. In most places and most times, Newton's universe and Einstein's universe are so nearly identical that only the most precise instruments of science, stretched to the limits of their abilities, can detect the tiny differences. But there are times and places in the universe where conditions are so extreme that only Einstein's theory can explain them. For example, when a very large star, much larger than the sun, exhausts its nuclear fuel, it starts to collapse under its own gravity. Some of the mass is blasted away in a violent explosion, but with no force strong enough to oppose the collapse, the inward fall of the rest continues until gravity becomes so intense that space-time itself is stretched and warped into a point of infinite curvature called a black hole. Like an ordinary projectile falling back to Earth, light itself and absolutely anything else is drawn back by that awesome concentration of mass. It takes an immense amount of mass crowded into a tiny space to create a black hole. If black holes exist, they are either remnants of collapsed giant stars or they may be primeval, left over from the Big Bang the instant when the universe began.